house of the Lord tonight, amen? Could be anywhere else, but we're here, ready to praise and worship God and hear what he has for us in the word. I'm going to be in the book of Joshua tonight, chapter number one and chapter number five. So if you would find uh, that, it's in the Old Testament, book of Joshua, before the book of Judges, Joshua chapter number one, we're going to be in verses eight and nine, and then we're going to be in chapter five, verses two through five. The message titled tonight is Be Prepared, Be Prepared. When you find your place, say amen. amen. If you're able, stand to your feet. Joshua chapter number 1, verse number 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse number 9, Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now, if you would, please flip over to Joshua chapter number 5, just a few pages over. We're going to be in verses number 2 through 5. And it says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. Father God, Lord, I pray you be with me tonight, Lord. Just hide me behind your cross, Lord, and give me the words to speak to hearts for those that are here for those that are watching, those that will watch later, God, may you give me something that will touch them. That if they're a child of yours and they're away from you, that God, they come to this altar tonight and make things right with you and come back to you. Or if they don't know you, Father God, that they would come to you and come to know you tonight and receive your free gift before it's too late. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for our sins. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Be prepared. Be prepared for what? Well, you can be prepared for several different things. The Bible tells us to be prepared for his coming and to watch for him to come back because we know not when the day nor the hour. Folks, I'm here to tell you we're closer now than we've ever been. Reading the book of Revelation, you can see that time is getting exactly to where it's not going to happen much longer. I'm here to tell you tonight that if you're sitting here and you've got the head knowledge and you know the Bible here a big difference to knowing it here than knowing it here. A lot of people out there in the world that's living in sin can quote the Bible. Why? Because they learned it when they were kids. They learned it as kids growing up. And don't tell me that a kid can't remember when they're older the things that they've learned because they can't. These kids that are in the back, I know when we're teaching children's church sometimes, it seems like they're not listening. But they are. You may think they're not listening because they're talking or they're down on their collar on their page or they're doing whatever activity you give them, but they know what you're saying. Sunday morning, I did something a little different with them, and the lesson was on Paul and Silas and about how they were in prison and how when they were in prison, they were still glorifying God and they were still praising God while they were in prison by praying and by singing. So I, I read the lesson, did the lesson with them, and I stepped out for a little bit and came back in and I turned the lights out on them. Well, they got really quiet. They were like, why is the lights out? And I went over to the table with them and I sat down. And I began to tell them that this is what it was like in Bible times. There was no electricity. There were no lights. They had to use lantern lights or, or candles to see what they were looking at. And I had them close their eyes and put their hand in front of their face. And I said, can you see your hand? And they all said, well, no. I said, well, that's what Paul and Silas was looking at. They were in the pitch black. Well, how did I know that? Because the Bible says that after the earthquake happened, that the guard called for a lantern so he could see. Which means that the, 
the, the, the prisoners were in the dark. And as I got to begin talking, I noticed that the kids started listening. And they started to learn more. You may not think a kid's listening to you when you're talking about the Bible or when you're talking about certain things. But later on, they'll bring it up. Because one of the little kids came up to me. We got done a little bit early and One of the little kids came up to me and started asking me questions. A little girl named Nyla. And she started asking me questions about the story. So I got a chance to talk to her more about the story. They listen. You know what's wrong with us as adults today? We're not preparing our children for the future. We're not getting them ready for what they're going to come across. We may get them ready for life, but we're not getting them ready biblically for what God tells us to get them ready for. We don't care. We bring our kids, a lot of our, a lot of our people bring kids to church and I'll let, go, back, go back and do the ch- 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 children activity. Go back and do this. Go back with the teens and do the teen activity. And then where are they the rest of the time? They don't come. You see, the churches in America need to be prepared because they're more about a show and they're more about me, me, me and I, I, I than they are about the main I. They're more about being glorified in the human body than they are more about being glorified God. That's who we need to glorify and praise. You see, the kids are learning back there that that's why they're coming to church. That's why I try to explain to them, when you come to church, you're coming to church to hear about God. You don't need to play to have fun. Yeah, it's always good to play a little game with them. We don't need to do that. We can still learn and play later. What is the purpose? Well, we've got to be prepared. The, uh, one of the greatest challenges in life is to be prepared for whatever comes our way. Are we always prepared? No. Life throws you a curveball. You're not always prepared for it. But what do we prepare for? Well, we watch the news or we watch the weather and what happens? Well, there's going to be a tornado coming. You got a tornado warning. Go to your shelter. We're prepared for that. Or there's going to be an earthquake. We're prepared for that. Down south, they have hurricanes. They talk, talking about the hurricanes rolling in. What do they start doing? Boarding up their doors, boarding up their windows, starting to leave town. They're prepared for that. But there's certain things that we can't be prepared for. And one of them is when Satan attacks. A lot of times he attacks us when we're not ready. Folks, we have got to be prepared. The Webster Dictionary defines the word prepared as to make ready beforehand for some purpose, use, or activity to work out the details or to plan in advance. You start hearing about a hurricane, what happens? Home Depot, Lowe's, Lumberyard start selling out of lumber, right? Because they're tacking up their windows. They start talking about hurricane earthquakes. They start talking about tornadoes. People start running to the store, grabbing the bread and the milk when it starts to snow. I don't know why they just want bread and milk, but that seems to be the thing that goes when snow comes. They grab the bread, they grab the milk, they start stocking up stuff just in case power goes out. They have something to eat. We always prepare ourselves. But folks, we can't prepare for the devil. I want you to see, number one, we got to prepare for the battle. we got to prepare for the battle. The Bible is for today. The Bible is our training tool. The Bible is what will bring you and prepare you to be prepared when Satan comes your way. The Bible is our foundation. The Bible is what we need to use to learn what to stand on, to learn what to build on. You build a house, what do you use foundation? You got to use concrete for your foundation, right? There's an old song that the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. What happened to the foolish man? His house fell. It collapsed. The, fool, the, the wise man built upon a rock and it stood. You got to build on something. Folks, our foundation is right in front of us. God has given us an instruction manual to follow that we need to use in our everyday life. Well, that book was written over 400 years ago. It's not going to apply today. It doesn't. I've never seen nothing in the Bible that didn't apply to today. Now, we don't have an ark, and he's not going to tell Joe to go out and build an ark. We may not need an ark, but there's times we might need a boat. All right? I tell you what, if God tells you you need a boat, you better get a boat. 
If God tells you to be prepared for the battle that's coming, be prepared. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if you are a child of God, the devil is going to attack you. Folks, the church is getting ready to go through a big change. Pastor Jones, after 54 years, is getting ready to hand a torch over to Brother Nelson, our new pastor. It's going to be a change for all of us. It's going to be different. Things, are, things might change, things might not. It's going to be different for all of us. But I'm here to tell you, if we stand upon the Word of God, and Pastor Nelson stands upon the Word of God, which he has, I've listened to him preach, and a man preaches the truth. If he's standing on the Word of God like Pastor Jones has for so many years, Main Cross Independent Baptist Church will continue. It will not fall. As long as we stand on the foundation which God has given us, which is the King James Version of the Bible. As long as we keep standing on it, main cross will survive. It will not fall. The devil will attack because he knows the church is going to be vulnerable at this time when we're starting to switch over. The devil is going to try to attack. Folks, the devil does come to church and the devil will attack us. But we got to be prepared. We got to stand up. We got to put our dukes up and say we're ready to fight. We can't shove it off to the side and just forget about it and say, I'll let somebody else handle it. No, it's our job as a congregation to fight when the devil walks in the door to be ready to say, get out of here. You got no part here. It's our time to stand. It's our time to use the Bible. It's our time to say, devil, get out of here. Because he will come and he will attack. The Bible's our strength. I don't know about you, but I could be feeling down and not wanting to do anything and look up and grab my Bible and start to read my Bible and my day starts to go a little bit better. My day starts to go a lot better. I start to smile. I start to get a little jump in my step. I start to feel a little better because I've had some time with God. You ever had a real bad day at work or a real bad day at home? Husband and wife bitter and fighting and biting each other and Screaming and hollering and bickering. When that happens, grab your Bible. Sit down as a, as a, a group, as a, as a couple, and read your Bible together and watch what God does. I was always told, and it was by Marlene's grandma, she would always tell us, don't go to bed mad at each other. Don't go to bed mad at each other. Work it out before you go to bed. Why? Because you never know. You might die that night and then you're mad at your spouse. Or your spouse is mad at you and you go and pass on and your spouse can't make that up. Or your friend. You're mad at your friend. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if you get mad at anybody, make sure it's the devil. Get mad at him. You may not agree with something that somebody does, but the Bible says if you don't agree with something and it doesn't line up biblically, the Bible says you are to go to them out of what? Out of love. And tell them, hey, you know, you really hurt my feelings there. I don't agree with something that happened. And you tell them what happened and why you don't agree with it. But I tell you, as long as they stand on this Bible and they can pull it out of the Bible and show you why they say that, if they're biblically correct, you're wrong. But then again, somebody says, well, I didn't see it that way. You may not. Because then again, you're going to, Josh may read something, and Brother Charles reads something, and me read something, and, and Brother Doug reads something, and we all get something different out of it. And we all work it toward our life in the way that we need to. Why? Because God reveals that to us. What we need to situate. What we need to do. It's not only our foundation and our strength, but it's our source of success. When you read the Bible, it becomes your source of success. It carries you through that problem, whatever it is. It brings you through that problem. God guides you through that problem. He takes you and he walks you down the aisle and he says, I'm going to walk you through it. Just keep your eyes on me and don't look either way. What happened to Peter? He stepped out of the boat and he began to walk. And as long as he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus... He was fine. But what happened 
The waves started coming up and started splashing up against him. And he started getting a little scared. And he took his eyes off Jesus. And he looked down and he began to sink. And all he said was, Lord, save me. And immediately, he pulled him up. Folks, I'm here to tell you that if you're lost, you can simply come to this altar and say, Lord, save me, and mean it in your heart. And guess what? He will save you. Folks, you've got to know who your enemy is. Look with me in Ephesians chapter number 6, verses 11 through 13. It says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I looked up that word wiles because I wanted to know what it meant. The word wiles means to deceive or to beguile. What's the devil going to do? He's going to deceive you. He's going to want you to fall. He's going to want you not to listen to what's being said, give you a distraction to get your mind on something else, get you to talk to your neighbor and get your mind off of it, get you to play on your phone, get you to watch TV when you're at home instead of getting in the Word and studying like you should be, get you to watch something on TV or when you're on your computer, get you to look at something you shouldn't. He'll trick you. The word wiles is found in the Bible twice. Once in Numbers 25, 18, and then here again in Ephesians 6, 11. He's telling you that you can stand against the wiles of the devil if you put on the whole armor of God. That's a spiritual battle that we have. How do we stop the spiritual battle? Well, we use the sword of the Spirit or through the Word. It's the only offensive weapon that is mentioned in the armor of God. The only offensive weapon. Every other weapon that's mentioned for the armor of God is defensive. That is the breastplate of righteousness. It's defensive. It keeps you from getting stabbed. The shield of faith. To block arrows. To block anything that comes in your way. The helmet of salvation. To keep your head safe. The sword of the spirit is the Bible, the Word of God, and it's offensive. With the sword of the Spirit, we can defeat anything that comes up against us with the Bible. Anything that comes up against us, we can beat it with the Bible. Jenny told a story one time, she got pulled over. If I remember right, she got pulled over. I don't know if it was here. The way she drives, she got to get pulled over more. But <laughs> She's passed me on 62, trust me. She drives fast, don't she, Doug? <laughs> but she got pulled over one time and they asked her if she had any weapons in the car and her response was I have a sword and it's a good thing they didn't pull her out of the car because she told them I have a sword and then she hurried up and said I have my bible she changed it real quick because they were probably pulled her out and searched her car man I would have loved to have been driving by and seeing Jenny and Cuff standing outside that police car them looking for a sword but you know, if you got the sword of the Lord with you, you've got nothing to worry about. Why? Because he's always with you. You can take this Bible, and it's very simple. If you don't want to carry this around, get you a smaller one. I have a hard time seeing the smaller ones, so i got giant print. But take you a, a little Bible, or you know what? You can even download a King James Bible on your cell phone. We got these smartphones now that can do about anything. Sometimes I think they're dumb phones, but they call them smartphones. But you can download the King James Bible on your smartphone and you can read the Bible on your phone. Ain't that something? Why do they do that? Well, because there's countries that can't use the Bible. Guess what? They can download it on their phone and the government will never know unless they try to hack into their phones, which I'm sure some of them have. And folks, I'm here to tell you, use the sword of the Lord to fight the devil. Use the sword of the Lord and be prepared. Be aware. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking 
whom he may devour. That devil is walking around and he's waiting to catch you when you least are not prepared to catch you off guard to get you to do something that's going to ruin your testimony, get you to do something that's going to get you to slip in front of somebody who needs to know God. And he'll do it. And you know what they'll say? Well, if he can do that, I can do that. I hate to go to a restaurant sometimes when there's beer around because I was a drinker. And the first thing that I know happens when I start seeing people around me grab a beer and start drinking a beer is the old devil starts getting in my ear. Don't that look good? Wouldn't you like to have one? Folks, I, I drink. I, I don't drink what I used to, but I drink all I want. I got water. I got tea. I got coffee. I got Gatorade. I can drink anything I want. I just don't drink what I used to. But the devil even tries to go after pastors. You want to see a church close the quickest, the devil will go after the man who's standing behind the pulpit faster than they will anybody else in the church. You don't think that Pastor Jones, through all the years, has not fought a battle with Satan? I remember when I was a kid, he had a boxing match with the devil. For those of you that were here when we had vacation Bible school, Brother Jones got in the ring, and they made this platform up here into a boxing ring, and he fought the devil in a, in a boxing match. He cheated to win, but he won. He pulled the Bible out, showed it to the devil, punched the devil, and the devil went down. He won. But you know, there was a reason why he did that. He wanted to show us that even though the devil was punching, I'm getting on their nerves, that's why they're leaving. <laughs> even uh, he had a point the reason why the reason why he did that was to prove to us kids that no matter how many blows the devil takes at you no matter how many times the devil hits you the word of God will drop the devil in a heartbeat and stop the devil right where he's at and there ain't a thing he can do about it overcome all the obstacles if you use the sword of the Lord. 1 Samuel 17, 47 says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give unto our hands. He will give you into our hands. The Lord will fight your battle. Well, I'm going through this. Well, you're going to learn something out of it when it's done. You may go through this for a while. You may go through health issues. You may go through financial problems. You may go through marriage problems. But God is putting you through that for a reason. He's letting that happen to test you. Keep your eye on the Lord. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Put the blinders on that they use on the horses and go to work. Amen. Folks, we got this new pastor coming in who's very excited about being here. He's very excited about being here. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to get to work for the Lord. You want to see Main Cross grow? Folks, we're going to have to get behind the plow. We're going to have to stand with our new pastor. And we're going to have to do some work to see souls won and to see Main Cross grow. It's going to take work. It's going to take hard work. You might sweat. You might cry. But it's all for the glory of God. We're going to have to put our hands to the plow. I've never used a plow, especially the old ones that they had. I don't know, some of, some of you all may have the old plows where they had the horse in the front and they put the blinders on. Why did they do that? So the horse will go straight. So the horse don't look to the left and to the right and go every which way. The line stayed straight. Folks, that's what we need as a church. We need blinders to blind us from what's going on at the outside, to keep our eye on the prize, to keep our eyes on the man in that picture back there who's knocking on that door. Keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and do what he would have us to do, folks, and we will see a difference. Don't give up. Don't throw your hands up and say, I quit. I can't do this anymore. God, help me. I can't do it. I stop. God's not helping me. Have you asked God for help? If you don't ask him for help, he ain't going to help you. 
He's going to leave you out there. Get on your knees and come to an altar and cry out to God and say, I need help. I need help. Don't be afraid to do that. Who cares what people think? Don't be ashamed to come to the altar and pray to God. He is your Father in heaven. He died for you and laid his life down for you. If he can do that, you can walk down the aisle and come down here or sit on the front pew and cry out to him. You want to see a change in Charlestown, Indiana? You want to see a change at Main Cross Independent Baptist Church? It starts right now at the altar on the front pew, and if you can't walk where you're at, crying out to him, saying, God, take control. we got to be prepared because the devil is going to throw stuff at us. Number two, prepare for the victory. It takes faith. Look at 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our flesh. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Who overcomes the world? The one that believes Jesus is the Son of God. To be a Christian, you got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can't just believe God. You can't believe in the Holy Spirit. You can't believe in Jesus only. you got to believe in the Trinity, the three. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. you got to believe the three in one. You can't pick and choose which one you believe in because they're all the same. you got to have trust. You want a victory? you got to trust in Him. Look at Psalm 7-1. Oh, Lord, my God. And thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Man, what would happen if each and every one of us tonight came to the altar or stayed where we were at and said this and said these words I put my trust in thee. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. What would happen if we asked God to save us from those who persecute us, those who make fun of us, those who mock us because we go to church? Save me from those people and deliver me. What would happen if we prayed that tonight? What would happen if we cried out to God, Lord, I need you now. God, our church needs you. Lord, our pastor coming in needs you. Our pastor that's leaving needs you. Each and every one of us need him. What if we cried out tonight as a church and we came down to an altar and we just threw our hands up and began to cry and say, God, I can't do it anymore. I need your help. The church needs your help. We don't follow man. We follow God. Yeah, I know Pastor Jones is leaving and I know some of us has known him for years. I'm 44 years old and he's known me from the day I was born. He, he can tell you stories on me. He's known me my whole life. The whole Jones family has known me my whole life. I'd come to school here and go over there, and Chrissy would babysit me. Yep, he would. But I'm here to tell you that's, that's why I'm so mean today is because Chrissy was my babysitter. But I'm here to tell you this man who's over there at home, probably resting now, loves the Lord. His wife sitting here on the front pew, who's going to be there for a long time. She's not going to move. She's going to be sitting there amening, praising God, loves the Lord. Amen. She loves the Lord. That family loves the Lord. They love us. They want to see Main Cross flourish. They want to see this church continue to grow. It's going to take us to be prepared to work to be prepared to get on our knees and to lift our new pastor up in prayer and to take care of him the way that we would the man who just walked out the door. Amen. For many years, we've taken care of him. Amen. For many years, he's been there for a lot of us when we needed him. One, two, three o'clock in the morning, his phone would ring and he'd answer. He was always there. The new pastor will be the same way. I've spoke to Brother Audie in, in detail, and 
I'm excited for him to be here. Yeah, it's going to be sad when, when Pastor Jones steps down as pastor and becomes a member. But he's still here, folks. We can still hug him. We can still love on him. You know what? We can still lift him up in prayer. He doesn't have to stop. We don't have to stop praying for him just because he's not our pastor. Who knows? God may heal him after he steps down because he won't have as much worry on his back. He won't have the burden of, of, the, of people calling him at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and saying, Pastor, I need this. Pastor, I need that. He got so he couldn't even go and visit people in the hospital. And I know he wanted to. I know his heart. Pray for him and lift him up, even though he's not going to be our pastor anymore. But you know what? Even though he's our pastor, you know what he is? He's our brother in Christ. And he'll continue to be that. We as a church need to get together. Sunday morning, Pastor Adi will take over Main Cross Independent Baptist Church. The torch will be handed over. We need tonight as a church, this is the backbone of the church, we need tonight to be prepared for the devil to attack Sunday because he's going to do it. How do we be prepared? We come up, we get off our blessed assurance, and we come down here, or we sit there, or we sit where we're at, and we pray to God that the devil doesn't come in and try to tear this church down. We need to be prepared to fight. We need to prepare for eternity. Number three, prepare for eternity. The greatest preparation is eternity. Three of my favorite verses in the Bible are found in John chapter number 14, beginning in verse number 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. You see, he went to prepare a place for you. That place is prepared, but we got to be prepared to fight. Folks, there's going to be people Sunday afternoon that's going to come in here that may be lost. That's known Pastor Jones and Sister Jones for years. There may be kids from the Christian school that may show up. I've contacted some of them. I hope they come. I've contacted some past members. I hope they come. They're going to be here. They may be lost. They might not know Jesus Christ. They may not know our new pastor. But folks, what do we need to do? we got to be prepared. Come to church Sunday with a smile on your face. Come and leave your burdens at Calvary. That song says, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Jesus is here, folks. He's here tonight. Make your reservations today to go to that place that he's prepared for you. 1 Peter 1, 4 says, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I've got family in heaven today that I'm waiting to see. I've got a dad who passed away when I was eight years old who was a great godly man. He's in heaven today. I'm waiting to see my dad. I'm waiting to see my brother-in-law who attended this church for many years. I'm waiting, Elizabeth's dad, I'm waiting to see him when I get to heaven. There's other men and other women in this church that's went on. I think of Pete Limp. Loved Brother Pete. He's in heaven today. I can't wait to see Brother Pete. He'd always sit toward the back, back right back here where David was, and I'd come in the door, and he'd have a big smile on his face, and he'd hug me, and he'd say, I love you. And I'd say, I love you too, Brother Pete. He was a World War II veteran. He's gone on now. He's celebrating on the streets of gold. To think that we've got a reservation there. 
Folks, don't delay. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says this, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if you're lost, today is your day for salvation. Musicians, come on up, please. I'm almost finished. Today is your day of salvation. If you're not lost and you know Jesus Christ, today is the day to come forward and pray for the church and lift the church up. Hey, if you're away from God and you ain't read your Bible in a month and you ain't prayed in a month, I'm here to tell you, you need to come down here and get right back with the Lord and walk the straight and narrow, keeping your eyes on Him. Don't stray away from the Word of God. Don't stray away from your prayers. Well, I don't have time, John. You don't understand my schedule. I work 12 hours a day. Wake up 30 minutes early. Read your Bible before you go to work. See what happens. Stay up 30 minutes later. You don't need to see the news. Ain't nothing on there you need to see anyway. Turn it off. Turn it off. Read your Bible for that half hour. Then go to bed. See if your night don't go better. Get up in the morning and put that armor of God on and get ready to fight. Are you waiting tonight thinking that you'll have tomorrow? Or maybe next week? You're not guaranteed the next minute. Are you scared to come forward because people will talk about me? I don't want to go to the altar and pray because people will talk about me. They'll think I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Just because you come to the altar don't mean you're doing something wrong. You can come to the altar to pray for our country. You can come to the altar to pray for lost loved ones. You can come to the altar to pray for friends. You can come to the altar to pray for somebody you don't even know. Doesn't mean you're lost because you come to the altar. Today is the day, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month or next year. The Bible says the time is now. You're not guaranteed to walk out these doors alive. There was a, a, a pastor in Alabama, fundamental independent Baptist preacher down in Alabama. Sunday morning he was preaching his sermon. And he got to the part where he started talking about the Romans road to heaven. He stepped down off the pulpit and Got about four rows back, dropped over dead. 62 years old, dropped over dead in front of his congregation. Preaching about God. What better way to go? A little scary for the congregation, but what better way to go? If nothing else, come up here and pray for your lost loved ones. We all have them. Friends. Our country, Josh gave me something to put out on the board. When you leave tonight, I'm going to try to get it loaded. So if you come back between now and Sunday or even Sunday, read what it says. It says, July 4th, 1776, our country was born, one nation under God. Then you read the bottom of it and it says, it needs to get back and be born again. Pray for our country. Pray for our leaders. We've turned away from God. Pray for Pastor Jones and Sister Jones. Pray for Brother Audie and his family as they come up, as they move here. They don't know if they're going to have any furniture when they get here or not for a while. They don't know how long it's going to take the movers to get here. But pray God will move. Folks, I'm here to tell you that if you come tonight and you give everything to God, God will move. God will take care of the problem. I'd love to see these altars flooded or, or people praying for our outgoing pastor and his family and our new coming pastor. Praying for the church. That's what we need. Prayer. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. See what he can do. I heard what he did in two years in North Carolina. He had 16 members when he started that church. Now they're running about, I think, about 70 to 75 every Sunday. Why? Because he loves the Lord. He's not afraid to go door knocking and knock on doors. I can remember when Pastor Jones was younger, he would do that. He wouldn't go to a door with a dog, though. 
He didn't care if it was a chihuahua or a pit bull. If he seen a dog, if you were with him, you were going to that door. But he would knock on doors. Saturday mornings, we'd go on visitation. We'd get in the bus, and we'd start making our way, knocking on doors. Sister Jones would see a yard sale. Stop the bus! <laughs> we used to have time, good times. Folks, there, you can still have a good time. Amen. Nothing wrong with laughing in church and having a good time. Come tonight and come forward as Jenny begins to play. Come forward tonight. Come to the altar. Give this church to God. Pray for Pastor Jones and Sister Jones and the Jones family. This is going to be a change for them. A huge change. Pray for the Nelsons who's coming in and he's taking and standing behind this pulpit and preaching to us so we can grow. Folks, let's get ready to work. Let's be prepared for the devil to attack. Let's get the armor of God on and get here and stand and grab that sword of the Lord and say, come at me, devil. Give me what you got. I'm ready to go and fight. Father God, we thank you for this time that we've had. Lord, I pray that if there's one person here that don't know